Greetings, one and all. I'm from the country, Somerset. My mother was a pastor for over 30 years. So I knew, right or wrong, I was brought up to serve God. But I chose to go my own way. And I suffered terrible for it. But I thank God that I've had a real to Damascus experience. And I've rededicated my life and my heart to God so that God's will can be done in my life. My name is Brother Randy Lightfoot. Join me as I share the word of God. My topic today is, does the Holy Ghost really matter? Whenever we speak, especially in um, these times, concerning the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God, it has become controversial in a lot of churches, a lot of Pentecostal churches, even charismatic churches. And I want to deal with question of does it really matter in our walk with God? And I pray that as I bring forth this word that the Holy Ghost itself, himself, would reveal the truth to you and give you clarity on the Holy Ghost, whether it matters and how it matters in our walk with God. Let's turn to uh, chapter uh, 14, and we're going to read verses 15 to 18, first of all, and then we're going to read verse 25 to 27. If you love me, keep my commandment, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In verse 25 to 27, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I have uh, two points that I want to speak from today. Point number one is the spirit came upon you. Point number two is the spirit indwelling in you. Let's go straight into point number one. The spirit came upon you. What I want to do, first of all, is highlight a whole lot of scriptures, and specifically scriptures from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. There's a few scriptures that I want to read, and what I'm going to do is read them all. They're from various different books in the Bible, but in the end, you will get the idea of why I've chosen all these different scriptures. Point one, the Spirit came upon you. Let's Look at Judges chapter 14, verse 5 to 6. Judges chapter 14, verses 5 to 6. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Tembleth and came to the vineyards of Tembleth. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And he rent him as he would have rent. A kid, and he had nothing in his hands, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and sat them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, 
They prophesied and did not cease. Amen. Let's turn lastly to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10. And it reads, And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. May, may God have a blessing to the reading of his holy word. I read from Judges, I read from Numbers, and I read from 1 Samuel chapter 10. I'm going to highlight each of these because each of them gives you a clear indication that the Spirit of God was in operation in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant. What I want to highlight in this first point is that in each of these scriptural texts that I read, the Holy Spirit came upon certain people at certain times. The Spirit would come upon them. And Samson's one, I think, is very interesting because in that particular instance, if you read the book of Judges and if you read the account of Samson, you'll see that Samson was a special gift from God. And Samson had special strengths. And these strengths was in the covenant that God had made with his mother. And ultimately with him in terms of him being a Nazarite. And part of him being a Nazarite was the fact that he didn't cut his hair. Many of us who know the story of Samson know that when he got involved with this woman, the Lila, the Philistines used her to try to find out where Samson's strength came from. And one of the things that was revealed, ultimately, you know, Samson done some tricks with her and them. I'm lying to him of where his strength really was. And they would tie him up with old types of chains and stuff. And, and then she would cry out to him, listen, the, the Philistines are hurt. And then he'll get up and break the chains off and go on his way. Eventually, he told her that his strength was in his hurt. And those of us who would read that might believe when you read the uh, content of it that Samson's strength was really in his hurt. Because what happens is he eventually tells her that his strength is in his hurt. She cuts all his hair off and then does the same thing again and telling him that, that, that the Philistines are come upon him and he goes to get up and the Philistines hurl him down, pluck out his eyes and make a mockery of him. So when you listen to that, you would tend to believe that Samson's strength had to have really been in his hurt. Because once that was gone, he had no strength. One of the things I wanna highlight her when you deal with the Samson issue is that that scripture I read earlier in, in Judges 14, the account of him traveling on his way and a young lion coming upon him. And then it says, Samson, as he went, a young lion came upon him. And he, it says that the spirit of God came upon him, came upon him. And he took that little young lion and he rent it like it was a tear, like a tear goat with his bare hands. Anybody that's been to a zoo, anybody that knows anything about a lion, any man that is going to manhandle a lion has got some supernatural strength. Okay. Samson is said in this text that the spirit of God came upon him. Samson was able to have that special relationship with God in terms of the spirit of God coming upon him because of the vow of a Nazarite that he made. That was a special gift that God had given him. So when this lion came roaring out and thought he was going to consume him like he normally would do to any other man, Samson took care of this lion like it was a kid goat with his bare hands, 
and he never even told nobody. This was a special blessing that Samson had because of the covenant he had being a Nazarite. I want you to get the picture because most of our accounts of Samson is this guy that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger when Arnold Schwarzenegger was in his younger days. This big muscular guy. Samson had some very abnormal strength if you go through the accounts of Samson's life. Whenever the Spirit of God, you would read it many different times. That's one account. But many different times, the Spirit of God will come upon Samson and he will do great things. So these Philistines knew that looking at the man Samson, he did not have the strength to be doing what he was doing. So they knew that his strength had to have been coming from somewhere else. So they asked the question, find out where his strength come from. He eventually tells her that it's in his hair. Samson's strength did not lie in his hair. Samson's strength lied in his covenant, which was part of his hair. So once he revealed that his hair was part of it, though the Delilah the and the Philistines didn't understand the covenant, once they cut his hair and broke his covenant, then he lost that co connection where the Holy Spirit can, can come upon him. So when Samson woke up and found out that his hair was cut off, he still tried to get up, but there was no spirit of God that was going to come upon him and because Samson was a normal man. The difference was that he was in a place, he was under a covenant with God where the Holy Spirit would come upon him. We live in a time and in a new covenant where we know differently how the Holy Spirit operates. What I'm trying to get in these Old Testament scriptures is to show you how the Holy Spirit operates. There was a certain power that will come upon you. When you look at the, the scripture that I read in Numbers, that account there is Moses and 70 elders. And those of us who are familiar with it would know that that scripture is dealing with a time when the Israelites as always complaining to God, wanting more food and thinking that they can make it. And some of them were, were lost in saying that they wished that they were back in Egypt where they had certain foods and they mentioned some of the foods, cucumbers. And if you ever study the special foods of Egypt, you will find that the cucumber and, and some of the soybeans and, 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 and some of the wheats are some of the best that's ever been found in the world. The Israelites now are in route to the promised land. And they're crying because they're eating men in every day. This sets up chapter 11 of Numbers. God tells Moses, listen, go get 70 men and bring them into the temple. Verse 24 talks, reaches the, the, the point where the 70, or almost the whole 70, are in the temple. And then God comes in a car. And then he took the spirit, his spirit, that verse 25 says, that was in Moses, and took part of that spirit and sprinkled it on the other 70 elders of Israel. And then he sprinkled the Holy Spirit that was in Moses among those 70. They all started to prophesy, and the scripture finishes up in verse 25 saying, and they did not cease. But what I didn't get into is that if, if you read further in that same chapter, you'll find that two of the 70 wasn't in the temple. Two of the 70 were somewhere else. And when they were somewhere else, that Holy Spirit that God took from out of Moses and sprinkled in 70, Landing on them too, that wasn't where they were supposed to be. And then landing on them, they started prophesying. 
When that spirit of God came upon them, they started prophesying. And when they started prophesying, somebody ran into Joshua and some other people, and they ran to Moses and said, listen, it's, it's two of them over there prophesying. Stop them. And then Moses says, listen, I wish <laughs> that all of you had the spirit of God on you and that you all would be able to prophesy. Because what's happened to them is from God. I'm highlighting again that when this spirit of God came upon man in those days, it was a difference. We know of the Holy Spirit in the account of the Pentecost day. This gives clearer proof that the Holy Spirit was on earth before Pentecost. The difference is that it was only for special works of God. Samson got access to the Holy Spirit coming upon him because of the special covenant that God made with his father and mother and how they was to bring up Samson. That Nazarite vow. The Holy Spirit was present in many accounts all through scripture. But every time you see those accounts in the Old Testament, it is very clear. It says the Spirit of God came upon them. And that's what my first point is about. Dealing with how people responded and how the Holy Spirit operated in the end this, it's point number one. When the Spirit came upon people and what they done. One of the things that needs to be highlighted was that those days, those, that operation of the Holy Spirit is clearly different than the operation of the Holy Spirit as we know from the day of Pentecost going forward even to now. Those 70 elders were just in a place. Samson was just in a place. The last one that I read, 1 Samuel 10 and 10, is the final account of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone. It's similar to the account of what happened in the wilderness with, with Moses and the 70 elders. The Holy Spirit came upon them again, and they prophesied. This account here is Samuel, this person, when he, when he says, and when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him. The him here is King Saul. This is the account where Sam, Samuel is anointing Saul as king. If you read his account, you'll find that in the previous verses, it said that Samuel told him to go and, and that he would find these uh, uh, lost um, animals he was looking for and that he would meet certain people and that the spirit of God was going to come upon him and that he would prophesy. He would meet prophets and then he would prophesy. Verse 10 picks up where he meets up with them and then he starts to prophesy. And then it goes on in the next verses to say that from that point on, uh, a soul was no longer the same. He wasn't the same person. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul because he was anointed to be that king. He, from that point on, becomes changed. When the Holy Spirit came on Saul to set him up to be this new king of Israel, he became a new person. Those of us who know the accounts of Saul, we understand that Scripture goes on farther and in other chapters to say that the Spirit of God leaves Saul. It would no longer come upon him. Saul would have certain things that he would be dealing with and the Spirit of God would, would come upon him and change him. All these great men of God throughout the Old Testament, whenever they was doing a work for God, they could only be effective. They could only be powerful. They could only be different when the Spirit of God came upon them. And in these cases, in most of these cases, you see that they really didn't have a say in it. They was just doing what they were doing. And God would use them by putting the Holy Spirit upon them and making them do something great and making them do something outstanding. Gideon, 
It's countless people all through the Bible who've done great, unbelievable. Samson killed 3,000 men with a burn because the Spirit of God came upon him. All of these men that done great stuff, it was because God would allow the Holy Spirit to come in their lives and empower them. Scripture says that it would change them. David, when he sinned against God, when he went wrong, you see it in Psalms uh, 51, when he does that special prayer in Psalms 51, one of his cries to God is, Lord, take not your spirit from me. David knew the difference in his life and the success that was in his life was because the Holy Spirit would come upon him. He had access to the Holy Spirit coming upon him. But it was a limited experience. It was a very limited experience as opposed to what we now know and what we now have heard of and experienced ourselves from the day of Pentecost. That's why Jesus can say that the prophets and the law and everything were unto John the Baptist. The Old Testament ends, not with this Malachi, it ends with John the Baptist. And Jesus goes on to say that there is none greater. No one else out there greater. He raised John the Baptist over Daniel, over Abraham, over Moses. He raised John higher than them. But he says that from this point, he that is least in the kingdom of God after John the Baptist, since Christ is served, is greater than John the Baptist. And that's because of the Holy Spirit, which leads me to my second point. Point number two, the spirit indwelling in you. We are talking about a different type of an experience of the Holy Ghost in our lives. Not like what we just talked about. These men that were from the Old Testament, Samuel, Elijah, Moses, all these men, God was able to take the Holy Spirit that was in Moses and sprinkle it on 70 men who couldn't stop prophesying all day. It's a pattern that's being shown her. Samson, who was not this superhero looking guy, that's why the Philistines knew that it was some way, it was some trick to how Samson was as strong as he was. He wasn't physical enough. He wasn't big enough to be as strong as he was. Something was giving him a strength. What made Samson different was the indwelling Holy Spirit, was the freedom for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. That freedom was because of a special vow that he was operating in. Once he broke that vow, then that Holy Spirit did not have access on his life. The difference the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could only come upon them for a certain season and would go. What we're gonna find out in point number two is the difference now when the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. Let's look at different um, scriptures that I want to look at. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 8. And this is Jesus speaking here. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father had put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Remember that order though, because that actually gets really fulfilled. The, the other one is in Acts 2 uh, verses 1 to 4. 
This is after Jesus has given that call, command that he gave to them in Acts 1. He told them, don't go in the world, go and wait for this gift that is to come, which is the comforter. The, this is the same comforter that he had told them about in the scripture text I read earlier in John 14, where he told them that I would not leave you comfortless. Okay, now this is once they have continued in that directive that Christ gave them. Verse 1 of Acts 2 says, and, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Massive demonstration of the Holy Ghost, demonstration of power. Let's look at Acts 10 now. Acts 10 verses 44 and 45. It says, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they are the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with, with, with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out this gift of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. I've got one more. It's Acts 8, verse 17. Acts 8, verse 17. It says, They laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Christ starts off actually with a directive from Jesus to uh, uh, um, the, the 12 disciples plus the, the other 109. So it's the 11 apostles plus 109 other people. Total, it was 120 that was in this upper room that Christ gave that first directive that I read from Acts 1. In Acts 1, Jesus is telling them that they are to go into tarry unto so that they can receive this gift that is coming from God. They have spent over four, just over 40 days since Jesus' resurrection, talking with Jesus, Jesus showing them new deeds and opening up their understanding, full proof that he has risen from the dead. Jesus at this point is getting ready to leave earth. And then he's reminding them what I read to you earlier in John 14. In John 14, Jesus was saying that, listen, I'm going, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. If you read the beginning of that, chapter 14, it, it talks about, listen, uh, in my father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. As it reads down into 15, it talks about the fact that I'm not going to leave you comfortless but I'm going to send you this gift of the Holy Ghost. It is important that when Christ explains the Holy Ghost to them, one of the things that it is important that you understand is that the Holy Ghost is not a it, it's not a thing. Jesus is very clear. He says, he, I will leave him and he will come on. He will guide you into all truth. It is important that you understand that we as children of God in this new time, in this new covenant, are able to experience what Christ told the 120 to do in chapter one. He told them that you don't need to worry about the times and the seasons and all that stuff. What you need to worry about is getting yourself in position so that the comforter can come into your life and fill you, fill you with this Holy Ghost so that you can be empowered. There is a power in having the Holy Ghost in your life. It's already been seen 
in the Old Testament. And that was not an indwelling of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Whenever that Holy Spirit came upon them, these guys changed up. They became powerful. They became effective people. The only difference was that it wasn't interwelling there. It would come upon them for a season, for a reason, and then they would go back to their normal selves. That's why Jesus said that anyone who is least in the kingdom of God after John the Baptist is greater than him because they're able to have this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that this could not happen. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit could not happen unless he goes. Unless he goes. And he said that, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And he will do this and he will do that. You can go look at John 14 again, what we read earlier. The Holy Ghost empowers you. The Holy Ghost, Jesus said, was going to teach them all things and instruct them in all things. The Holy Ghost's main purpose was to always speak about Jesus. Always speak about Jesus. It says, this comforter, which the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So that means that the word of God is able to come back to us when the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. And everything that we need to be taught, he will teach us. Jesus said that this Holy Spirit is coming in my name. And he will, you, you'll read in Chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16 of John, leading up to Jesus last night on earth. All he's talking about is the fact that I'm going, but I'm going to leave you this comforter. I'm going to leave you this spirit of God. And he will testify of me. He'll remind you of everything that I'm taught you. He'll bring it back to your understanding. When the Spirit of God is indwelling you, it is a difference. Look at, again, Acts 2, which actually is the day of Pentecost, which actually is the first outpouring of the, the um, Holy Ghost. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And I just want to highlight that because I believe that that is the key factor in terms of the operation of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'll show you some different sets of circumstances in terms of when the Holy Spirit was given to people. And what you'll find is that there are different ways and different times that the Holy Spirit is given. Many churches, a uh, uh, little time, Pentecostal churches tell you that, oh, you need to come and you got to tarry her and tarry her for, for the, the Holy Ghost. But there are many scriptures in the text that show you that you can comfortably in fear, right, that the main ingredient for anybody receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost in their lives is the right mindset. Acts 2 says that they were in one place with all with one accord. So they had a mind to be seeking this Holy Spirit. They had a mind where they were open to receive the um, Holy Spirit. They were of one accord. And I believe that that was one of the main ingredients that gave freedom for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. I'm gonna quickly read where it talked about Peter when Peter was dealing with Cornelius and those Gentiles. If you read that account, you'll find that Cornelius and those guys were just receiving the gospel to them. But they had a mind to serve God. They had a mind where they wanted to know God. They were seeking God. They had surrendered everything else to knowing who God was. That was one of the reasons Cornelius sent for Peter, because his mind was in the right place. His heart was in the right place. He was already believing. He hadn't heard the full gospel, but he was believing in God. 
when you're truly believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you're completely surrendered to God, completely surrendered to God, that's the invitation for the Holy Spirit to indwell you, to come upon you and to fill you and to indwell you forever. That's the invitation that the Holy Spirit needs to come into your life. Because it's a gift that's been given to us. When this day of Pentecost comes and when we hear about them speaking in tongues and, and many of the people that were there heard the gospel spoken to them by different languages and different tongues by these people who were speaking in these tongues when the Holy Spirit came upon them. When the question is asked, why and how and are they drunk and all this, one of the main things that is explained is that they they bring up that Joel had tested Joel to prophesy that this is the spirit that God said that he would outpour in the last days. And that your sons and old men will, will have dreams and visions and your daughters are going to prophesy. This is all the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was promised. It's this gift that's promised, but it can only come upon you when you're a true believer that has surrendered your life to God. Because those of Cornelius' house had not even heard the full gospel. They had a proper understanding of who it was, and they most certainly hadn't been baptized because that, that's what gets brought up by Peter. Because while Peter, scripture says, while Peter spoke to them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started to um, speak in tongues. When they started to speak in tongues, Paul said, listen, can any man forbid them to be baptized who we see that the Holy Ghost has been given to even though that they are Gentiles? Scripture says that they was um, astonished. The access to the Holy Spirit is a surrendered heart from you. Those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you surrender your life to God, the Holy Spirit has free access to come into your life. In the olden days, you had to be in a position where God was going to use you because you didn't really even sometimes have a say in it. The Spirit of God would come upon you for what, whatever purpose it was to be. There are times when one come talks about Saul wanting to go and do something that he shouldn't have been doing, wanted to go and say what he wanted to say. And the Spirit of God touched him and made him prophesy. He didn't want to prophesy, but the Spirit of God came upon him. We don't operate that, that way today. God doesn't force himself on us. You have to have a surrendered heart, someone that truly believes in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, someone who has truly repented. One of my um, um, scriptures was in Acts 8. And 17, where it talks about the apostles laying hands on somebody and then they receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. But what you'll find that if, if you read that scripture, you'll you'll see that this these are many different ways. But the thing that is in common is that these were true believers, truly surrendered over to God. Those guys in Acts 8 and 17 is not the rule. That's an exception to the rule. These were disciples of John the Baptist. They were disciples of John the Baptist. And when these guys found him, you know, Peter found him, he asked them, he said, well, so what damn were you baptized to? If you're a believer, what damn were you baptized to? And then they brought up the fact, listen, we were baptized to the baptism of John, believing on the Messiah to come. And when he explained this stuff to them, he knew that they were believers. He knew that they were fully so rendered over to God. He was able to lay hands on them. And the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were filled with it. And from that point on, the Holy Spirit entwines. The whole point of the Holy Spirit in these days and in these times is so that we can be empowered, so that we can be messengers of God. I read earlier in Acts 1, he said, I want you to go to Judea, Jerusalem, and Samaria, and then onto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is what the Holy Spirit is going to enable you to do. And we have to understand that this is a gift given to us that we are supposed to be operating in. We don't have to be like the Old Testament and be subject to it coming upon us. It's supposed to endow us. Only we can get in the way. Ephesians 4 and 30 talks about 
Grieve not the Holy Ghost. Understand what that's saying. Grieve. We can grieve our parents. We can grieve our spouse. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can hurt it. Because you're going to get in its way. The more you surrender your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit operates out of your life and you've got power in your life. Paul's not saying that we are more than conquerors just to say it. He's saying we're more than conquerors because we have the indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives. So when the question is asked, does the Holy Ghost really matter? Of course it does. That's the most important thing in our world today. Jesus himself said, the Holy Spirit won't testify of himself, it'll testify of me. The Holy Spirit does everything for Jesus. All the Holy Spirit does is point you to, to Jesus. He, that Holy Spirit, is Jesus represented on this earth. That is the other part of the God here. That Holy Spirit makes the difference in your life. Whenever you're facing problems, whenever you've got trials and tribulations, whenever everything seems like it's going wrong, the Holy Spirit is there to let you know that Jesus has you. The Holy Spirit always points you to Jesus. When we operate in this Holy Spirit, we are free. We have a freedom. We have a power. We are powerful. Peter says in the, in the third chapter of Acts, Silver and gold have I not, but such as I have give I unto thee. When that guy that had been sitting at the um, temple day in and day out, asking people to give him money, Peter, after receiving the indwelling Holy Spirit, this guy 50-something days earlier was pointing out in the courtyard, swearing that he didn't know Jesus is walking boldly into the temple and tells this guy who had been, scripture says he had been sick, he had been crippled since he was born. Some um, tax say that he may have been almost 40 years old. Sitting at that temple begging for people to help him. Peter says, look on me. Because Peter knew what he had. Peter knew he had the indwelling Holy Spirit. When you read the Old Testament and you hear the account of among God, in dwelling that camp of Israel, it said that he he was in a ball of fire. He was a fire. He, he, he was represented as a fire. The spirit of God would come into the camp as a fire. What does it do when he reveals his spirit to him um, there? Acts 2 says it looked like clothes of fire resting on each of them's individual hair. Like the 70 that got it, it was resting on their heads, and they ran out exploding with power. God knows what he's doing. He has empowered us. That power, why not weakness? Why not I'm walking around scared? Well, we are walking around confident. We have the Holy Spirit inviting us. Why not worry about what the world's doing? They can't do nothing that God ain't going to allow them to do. Peter, Paul, all these guys went through tremendous experience. Everything wasn't going great in their lives. Read Paul's account of how he was shipwrecked three times. He, he was attacked by robbers, pearls, pearl of robbers and pearl of countrymen. He was whipped three times, beaten, left for one day, thrown out of windows. This don't sound like somebody that's empowered. But be assured, Paul said, I am more than a conqueror. Okay? Because he knew he had the indwelling power. Peter knew he had it. Peter walks to that temple. And I want us to take note of the fact that Jesus saw that same man. Scripture says that he went to that temple from, from when he was of age. He went to that temple daily seeking arms. Jesus didn't heal him. Jesus went across that temple many times with Peter, with John. And that same guy who was at that temple in chapter 3 of Acts. He was there. Jesus saw him. But Jesus just looked at him and said, Peter's can deal with you in a couple of weeks. Peter will fix you up in a couple of weeks. He didn't say it literally, but I know in the spirit, because Jesus could have healed him at any time when Jesus ran through. Jesus didn't heal everybody that he saw. 
Yeah. One thing's for sure, in that account, it shows that he left that guy so that Peter and John can fix him up. And then Peter got the comforter in his life. He was able to tell that guy, I don't have silver and I don't have gold, but what I do have, give I unto thee. And I want to remind each of us today that we need to know what we have. The indwelling Holy Spirit in our lives empowers us so that we should be powerful, effective, confident children of God, standing in the power of, of God, not in our own strength, but knowing that what indwells with this Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit can't do his work if you get in the way. Surrender your life to God. Open yourself up to God. This Holy Spirit will constantly overflow you. Jesus told the so, Maritime woman in John 4 that, listen, I would give you water that, that, that you'll never thirst again. We don't need to thirst. We have the Holy Spirit of God. He indwells us. It's not a it, it's a he. It's part of the God here. He is in us to empower us. We need to get out of his way. Paul said, listen, I have to constantly bring my flesh on the subjection so that that Holy Spirit can have its way in my life. This is the fight we all face today in our lives. We're all at different levels with it. But we've got to find out what we need to do. Hebrews 12 talks about laying aside every weight and whatever specific sin it is that is in your way that so easily causes you to go astray. Get it out of your way so that Holy Spirit and dwelling in you can make you powerful. This is the gift that Jesus talks about. Chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, unto the great prayer in um, chapter 17 of John, all he's talking about is this Holy Spirit that's going to come upon you, that's going to change your life, that's going to empower you. We, have, we, we as children of God today are supposed to be walking in that power. Samson took a lion by his bare hands. I've watched too many lion movies. Okay, I'm seeing too many documentaries on lions because they fascinate me. And these are some unbelievable creatures. And this one, old one, this was a young one with a lot of confidence. And scripture says the spirit of God came upon him and he tore that lion apart like it was a baby goat. Samson done all the great things. All through scripture, you see men of God done great things when the spirit of God came upon him. We live in a time where the spirit of God is able to live within us. Daily, we have access to that empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It don't matter what our voices are trying, what Satan's trying on our bodies, what bills we face, what, what illnesses we face. We are indwelled with the Spirit of God that represents Jesus. Jesus said that this Holy Ghost is coming in my name, and he will testify of me, and he'll teach you all things. He will enable you to go out there and represent me. today. Let's stand in the power of this Holy Spirit. Get out of its way. Let him have its way. So surrender your life. We sang many songs today about the Holy Spirit coming upon us, the Holy Spirit breathing in us, us walking in the Holy Spirit. This is a daily challenge we face every day in our life. The Holy Spirit is given to us today so that we can work and operate as effective Powerful Christians, confident Christians. No matter what we face, we walk in confidence because Christ is with us in this Holy Spirit. He walks with me daily. We are strengthened. The only thing that gets in the way is us. Paul said, bring it on the subjection to that Holy Spirit. Grieve not. Grieve. Grieve. That means we're hurting the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wants to operate in us in power and effectiveness. We hurt it. We grieve it when we get in the way of ourselves. Stay in the word of God. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything that I'm saying. He'll remind you of everything I'm saying. That's why it's important to hear that word of God so the Holy Spirit can bring it back to your memories whenever you need it. So I say today, the Holy Spirit really does matter. Each of us need to check ourselves and make sure that Holy Spirit has free access in our lives, and so that while we're walking in a true demonstration of the power of God. I pray that God blesses each person that has heard it and that something that is said 
continues to stimulate your spirit to let that Holy Spirit have its way in your life. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord.